Well, I just got this call one day, and uh, it was uh, Disney saying, how would you like to be involved in the design of this movie? And it was like a dream for me, because I've always been a, a great Disney fan since I was a child. John Musker told me that apparently he'd, uh, he'd known my work as a boy as he was growing up in uh, Chicago, because I'd had uh, an exhibition there of my sculptures, and also he'd seen my work for... Uh, Time magazine. I used to do Time magazine covers of the Beatles and Rowan and Martin and uh, Rockefeller and so forth. And he'd seen all these. And then I came to Los Angeles about four years ago with the uh, Magic Flute, which I did with Peter Hall. And they seemed to like that. And the combination of all these things convinced them that they should write to me. This is the original script here. And. Uh, it's written in a sort of a brilliant manner, and they know how to train the artist's imagination. So every stage direction, a bit of dialogue I read, made me think of a scene immediately, and I couldn't draw fast enough. These ideas kept flowing out of me. And I think originally they only wanted me to send maybe, you know, a dozen or so drawings, but I think I blasted them with about 40 drawings immediately. <laughs> in the movie developed and then I became production designer and I designed all the characters in the movie and uh, they said they wanted me to influence the the whole look of the thing The character of Hercules is, is very difficult. I think I'm slightly intimidated by knowing that he is the, the lead in the film and that he's got to... He's got to be good-looking. And he's got to be the hero. I'm afraid I think I have more ease drawing the, the wicked and the, the underworld. But um, this, in a way, has to be a conventionally good-looking man. I started by going to the British Museum and looking at various sculptures and Greek uh, vases. What most people know about Hercules is uh, the story of the labours of Hercules, where he had all these labours to complete before he was accepted. He had to fight the Nemean lion, uh, the Stymphalian birds, the clear out the Augean stables. The film does contain that, but it's all truncated. And it's really a story, I think, about um, Hercules uh, as uh, an innocent young man, feeling that his, his muscles and his strength are all that he needs, but finding, ultimately, that he really needs an inner strength and the love of a good woman. Long ago, in the faraway land of ancient Greece, there was a golden age of powerful gods and extraordinary heroes. And the greatest and strongest of all these heroes was the mighty Hercules. But what is the measure of a true hero? Now, uh, that is what our story Will is about. listen to him? He's making the story sound like some Greek tragedy. Lighten up, dude. Well, I come out sporadically. I mean, a lot of it is done by me sending drawings across. I, would, I will work uh, for maybe a month on a batch of drawings, and then maybe I'll come with them, or maybe I'll send them. Randy, I just I wanted to go over this business. When you, with young Herc, you remember, I kept saying to you, these feet are too big, right. these calves are too bulbous. 
and I sent you drawings, and you took no notice at all. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have to say to yourself? <laughs> I wanted to really push the shapes and the proportions like you do in your drawings. And part of it, too, was just to, to emphasize his awkwardness. You know, when I was a teenager, I had a size 11 foot at 5'7", or whatever I was, you know. I felt that... Um, Randy, the animator, was, was giving, making the feet far too big and making the calves far too bulbous. In fact, here's a note to Randy. At the risk of offending the brilliant Randy, I still think the hands, calf, muscles and feet are too large. So I'm continually trying. You see this large hand here and I've taken it down to that size. And maybe these large feet will get through into the movie. see the process right the way through. I not only make the designs, I help the animators through their various stages. There are about 12 or 14 supervising animators, and each one takes a major character. They then liaise with me, and we decide how that character will move, walk, talk. There are 24 frames per second. The main animator draws the main drawings. The in-betweeners do all the little boring drawings in between. Those rough animations are then filmed, and when they're finally doing the right sort of action, it is then passed to the cleanup department. They place a piece of paper over the top of the animator's drawings, and they trace with a very precise line the animation underneath. After that, it goes on to tape in the computer, and it's then colored in the computer. I don't know whether it's going to work, but I am trying at every stage of the movie to intervene right the way through. So I hope ultimately that it shows in the movie. I hope there is a, a unity and a one world feeling to it. He was really a seminal artist in terms of defining the style of this movie. just come in as an inspirational artist they would have slipped back to doing whatever they, they were comfortable with i mean do you resent someone coming in and saying and the director saying this is the way we would like it to be is it something which is very it's very great it pushes us to do things creatively that we normally wouldn't do I sure. mean, you sometimes you tend to fall into the rut of drawing characters a certain way and everything but with your style being so un-disney it's pushing us to explore shapes like for example the beard shape something that i mm -hmm. wouldn't think of on my own and it's 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 neat this is the character of hades with whom i've had the most trouble he's a god although he's been thrown out of olympus i've done many many drawings of him
a drawing is an, is an experiment, and I think one has to be prepared with a drawing to be completely courageous. You've got to, in a way, destroy it in order to create it. thought that he should have this uh, you know this this very cool smoky sardonic side but then when he gets angry he absolutely blazes and bursts like a sort of fireball in, uh, into anger oh, yeah. uh, so you've got the two two sides of his character this rather laid back cool side yeah oh um, definitely the uh, uh i think though um probably well, see, the only thing I love about your drawings is you're very intricate and things like that. And that's the other, that's where the Disney part comes in. We're going to have to simplify some of this down just because I don't, uh, cleanup would kill me if all if those lines are in All the, the fire yeah. things. Sure, sure. <laughs> but overall, they are sort of simple, basic shapes. I mean, yeah. by, by the time you clean that up there, you've just got a sort of a shape like that. Oh, yeah. I don't really think he actually gets to this point. This is. This is way beyond anything that uh, that we we've done, but it sure gives us an indication. What to change from that face to that face? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Gerald likes to draw just the extremes. He wants to just give you the image and the pose. I don't think Gerald's a man who really wants to draw 24 drawings for every single second of every single frame. Secondarily, his drawings are very loose. They will wiggle and move all over the frame, where animation does need to have things that are a little more tied down and not quite so loose, because I think your eye can't sustain that for 70, 90 minutes. For a four-minute short or five-minute short, I think the style might be really interesting, but I think over the long term, it will be distancing you from the character and the emotion of what you want besides just great art. I always remember as a child going to see Snow White and seeing the witch there, and it was absolutely frightening. But I knew I, at the end of the film I was okay because the witch died, and and I think you could, children can take a lot. Poison I'm sure Disney know all about this. They know how far to push it. But I always think that they could be pushing further, and that the villains could be truly villainous. Disney pulls its shots occasionally, and um, they look. Um, when, it, when they get their comeuppance, they look stupid and they have kind of appealing eyes and, oh, what's <laughs> happened to me, you know? I, I like to, would like to maintain a villain through to the very end. What was that name again? Hercules. He comes on with his big and farm boy routine, but I could see through that in a Peloponnesian minute. What? Okay, so basically... <laughs> well, as you can see, I've indicated some of the flames up mm -hmm. here, but... Uh, um, I think the big... What was that name again? Hercules. I think at that point, he's just about, he's inquiring, so he's still a little cool, but at that point, he explodes. What was that name again? Hercules. He comes on with his big and farm boy routine, but I could see through that in a Peloponnesian minute. Wait a minute. Wasn't Hercules the name of that kid we were supposed to? Oh, my God! So you took care of him, huh? Dead as a doornail. Weren't those your exact words? I hate his two sidekicks are pain and panic. And one of them I conceived panic as a sort of pan panicky little figure with kind of wide eyes. Continually in a sort of panic. Just the guys that do all the bad work. In my drawings for the animators, I try and suggest, although it's a single drawing, what the character and what the action could be. So if it looks rather uncertain like this, the animator will pick that up and include it in his action. The other one is pain. 
and he's a more he he actually has the voice of um a bobcat goldthwaite and um he's got a, got a voice like that he's just so that baby is screaming all the time often when i'm drawing something i i, I can hear the sound i can hear the droning voice of john major or the plummy tones of ted heath or the strident tones of margaret thatcher sometimes when I'm painting to sort of go around the forms or the watercolour because then the lines that the brush takes helps to give it a form. And that's sort of imagine the anatomy with the brush. So you're stroking a three-dimensional object so to go around the belly and then that way you hopefully get some sort of form into it. One always has to be careful with an artist's office sensibilities. They can be very upset very easily if you tell them something isn't right. You have to find a diplomatic way of saying it, of course. You can't say that is an awful drawing. Find another way of putting it. The fact that the little bit of movement that happens on him, it almost kind of gives him a cute quality to it, you know? The fact that every time he kind of teeters over, like, to walk somewhere, yeah. his little wings kind of flap, and it just kind of, just that little tiny subtle movement kind of gives it a little cute quality so to it, which I think. What is. you're saying is you wanted him to look cute. Yeah, I, I think I wanted him to have, like, a cuteness to him, even though he was a villain. Mm. Kind of like a cute little villain, you know? I, is that what I, you call the, the Disneyfication side of it? I mean, do you feel that... You know, a villain is a villain. Why yeah. does he have to look cute? Well, I think um, I think that's a just a little special quality that I want to put in this. Yeah. Guy. This is an original concept of what I wanted right. the design right. to look like, which I didn't like. Yeah, this is yeah very much so. You can kind of see what I was talking about with the flesh around the mm, eyebrows mm. to get it expressive. Um, has he got a kind of a pig nose or something? Yeah, he yeah. has like a big, like, you know, bulbous Snow. nose, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, he has like the big, you know, two foot mm -hmm. thing. That's kind of going towards like the style that, that, right. that worries me. Right. Uh, and it's a type of cartooning I suppose I don't really like. It's when you have a leg that's got a knee like that, and then it comes down and it's got every kind of little kink in it you can imagine. And then it goes, you know, and then you've got big toes here sticking out like that. And then you've got the heel here, like this. And then, you know, the calf there. And then the... It's, it's to me, that's kind of ugly drawing. And all, they would put hairs in. That was the kind of drawing I just didn't want at all. I can't draw Matisse, but this is, this is kind of the way I was hoping it would all go towards simplicity. If it was a, a woman's back, that the, the back would be sim simply a shape like that. And that would be a head up there. So, and then her arm would be... He, he did extremely yeah. kind of economic line work. Yeah, actually, that's really good for animation, especially. And it is, yes. Yeah. And that's really where I was hoping I would go. But a lot of people read my drawings as being extremely complicated and having many, many lines, yeah. which they do. But when I get as far as cleanup, that's really where I'd like yeah. to go. Well, with Pegasus, I was always slightly frightened that we would get the old kind of. Um, Dobbin like horse. That kind of thing, like that. I was I was just worried that that, that it would turn into that sort of horse. Whereas Pegasus, of course, is a, is a horse of the gods. And I well, first of all, I took my my inspiration from this, this wonderful horse here that, that um, I've got a model of, which comes from the British Museum. Um, I know, of course, that's never going to get into the film, but I'm going to try my best to get something like that. And taking this kind of line and this kind of elegance, um, I went on to try and get a sort of flow of line into it. <laughs> I 
thought very early on that he should have a, a Trojan mane. This kind of elegant, simple shape here, like this. I would, I, I would, I guess, in a way, my head is quite small, and I think some of the heads you've been doing are getting very large. Yeah, yeah, I think with the smaller head, it makes him a lot more elegant, especially with the longer line. Mm -hmm. um, looking at this, then I'm, I'm thinking that that I want to go to to this. Yeah, so I'm, these are much better. It's getting more towards a sort of a more of a thoroughbred now, isn't it? It's almost mm -hmm. much the old. The old farm horse Dobbin. Yeah, and it and, and it looks a little it's it's a little more ethereal, more like like this is this is a horse that could fly. Yeah. Although I always thought Pegasus would be an elegant horse, he is getting slightly sort of coarser here. But even so, I notice when even when I slim down, I'm still perhaps not slimming down as much as I should do. I'm, I'm affected by Disney, in effect. There's a sort of a crossover here. I'm getting, because I'm working with them at this size, I'm getting pulled towards the, the, the Disney way of doing it. What he does, and th these are the roughs here. He, um, he's being hugged by, that's supposed to be young Hurricane. Mm -hmm. He's being hugged, and he, he steps out of the hug into, into this magnificent pose. Like, like, aren't I terrific? Yeah. Um, and then he, he does this silly walk, sort of like a pigeon, where he sticks his neck way out. And then he ruffles his feathers. Right. And he comes up into this peacock pose. Mm -hmm. So I succeeded in making an elegant horse act silly. Very good. Pegasus! He's a magnificent horse with the brain of a bird. One can understand, given Disney's skills or anthropomorphic animals, that a winged horse would go down very well. To anyone who knows even a little about ancient myth, suddenly to find Heracles mounting Pegasus is a great surprise. One is immediately alerted to the fact this has really got very little indeed to do with the Hercules story that we know. Anatomy has always been very important to me because I think uh, as a child, I was an asthmatic child, I, I drew a lot as a child in bed, but I always felt the lack of education, and not only the lack of uh, normal education, but the lack of art training, because I didn't really ever go. I went for a short time to St. Martin's School of Art and a short, very short time to the Royal College of Art. Um, but I was always trying to draw what I thought was properly. And I, I always, this, this book is always on my, on my desk. It's simply a sort of a medical book. So even when I'm drawing these distorted caricatures, I would still like to think they have, they could move, they've got bones underneath this distorted shape. With the three feet, so it's just a skull-like shape. And then I think very, very skeletal shoulders. I tell you what worries me about these is that they didn't have any construction, they didn't have any uh, reality about them. Although they're grotesque characters, I thought they should have some sort of structure behind them. And I felt that the, there was no there was no body within the, within this figure here. You know, I couldn't see. It looked to me as though they ended at their knees down here. In other words, um, you can see this. It looks as, as though they were that short to me.
and even a little short one, you know, she should have a little short body with little short legs, and not just kind of end nowhere, which is what you were doing. But uh, it worked out actually that John and Ron liked the idea of not having a body, but having volume. If you look at the model of a tropo, she's actually the most three-dimensional of the three. Mm -hmm. And here the the assistants called me up and asked, "Should she? Does she have feet?" <laughs> and I told my lead Gail to say, "Tell them no. Don't worry. She doesn't have any feet." They by then had turned into very graphic figures. And this was okayed by Ron and John, and they were not human at this point. I noticed on one of your drawings, I think you had the nose of Lettuce's somehow like this with a nostril up there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like this, which looked to me kind of crude. That's the earliest one. Yeah, and then I, I sent back this drawing to you, which had the nostril following the line of the nose more. Mm -hmm. So that I felt it was more streamlined, more elegant. Because although these characters are weird and grotesque and wonderful, I still think they can be elegant. They still can have an elegant line. We wound up with a compromise so that the nostril is very long and following the line of her cheek mm -hmm. rather than all the way down to the end of the nose. That was, that was uh, not approved. Mm. We do have to please the directors here. <laughs> There's, there's a certain formulaic approach that can creep into your drawing, and I think that was uh, the challenge of, of Gerald's drawings, was to sort of blast some of the, the learned habits away from the animators, and I think they embraced that challenge. But it was, it's like anything you do, a uh, series of repetition or whatever, you have a certain muscle memory and it just a certain convenience and a certain thing that feels easy, and it's a little more painful, more struggle, more new muscles have to be, de be developed. A certain amount of cartooning, I find, um grotesque, I suppose, uh, in, in the wrong sort of way. I mean, my drawings are grotesque, but I do try and make elegant drawings of grotesque subjects. As, a, as an artist working in my studio, I, I have complete control over what I do. Whatever comes, up, comes into my head comes out on the paper. Now, when I'm working in a collaborative situation and someone else is interpreting my drawings or designs in the theater, then there's a certain amount of compromise. Obviously, that person who's doing the uh, interpretation isn't me. Managing 800 people is just not possible. You can't see all those artists. All you can do in that case is deal with the main artists. These look great. These are really nice. I have to tell you something, though. We'll never get that in a Disney cartoon. Yeah. You know? There are no backsides in Disney? Well, you know, they have a history of backsides in their films, but, you know, this is the 90s. Yeah. We have to be careful, so we'll indicate his goatee features a little bit more uh, subtly, shall we say. I was trying to get this sort of Danny DeVito uh, <laughs> look there. That's great. I love, I love the great graphic shapes you've got going here. Are you sure this is the right place? <laughs> What's the matter, little guy? You stuck? Whoa! Hey, put out, buddy! Ugh. Well, this is the part of the film where we introduce Phil to the audience. Her Hercules has come to seek him out mm -hmm. as a hero uh, trainer uh, and to enlist his services. So he's trying to prove to Phil at this point, you know, how strong he is. So he says, watch this, and he picks up this huge piece of statuary. <laughs> and he throws that off into the distance. So it becomes a big, a little dot. Holy era. Holy era. You know, maybe if I... No, no, snap out of it. I'm too old to get mixed up in this stuff again. Hurt cuts him off. But if I don't become a true hero, I'll never be able to rejoin my father, Zeus. Cut to this disbelieving expression of Phil. Hold it. Zeus is your father, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> Hold it. Zeus is your father, right? Part of the fun of doing these animation projects is how they cast people. And they don't necessarily cast us for our physical attributes, but they do cast us on, you know, how they feel the characters will be best animated, the types of personalities that we have and the types of personalities we're good at animating. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's like casting actors in a live-action movie, really. And, of course, a few people have said, well, gee, Phil, he's kind of short, he's kind of bald, and he's kind of overweight. And uh, so I walk down the hill hall, and people go, hi, Phil, instead of hi, Eric. So it's... Uh, You're also like <laughs> Danny DeVito, but a lot better looking. Uh, oh, thank you so much. So you want to be a hero, kid? Well, whoop-de-doo. 
I have been around the block before with blockheads just like you. Each and every one of disappointment, pain. Each and every one of disappointment, pain. For which there ain't no ointment. So much for excuses. Go a kid of Zeus is asking me to jump into the frame. I suppose I'm having most purchase really in the in the more wicked creatures. I think in the main characters, um, Disney is very much there. But uh, I think Disney are convinced that they are making a, a huge leap in my direction. <laughs> like a snake fit, they look far more menacing. And I always felt that in the eventual movie that they would writhe like this until they had one purpose, yeah. such as striking at Hercules. And when they, then they would pull back in unison and strike forward. But up until then, they were, like, they were looking into a snake pit. so many possibilities and such an exciting creature to do. One head giving birth to another head, birth, birth, birth to another head. It's, it's interesting that there are certain things that, like the many small teeth, that even that level of complexity, which which doesn't particularly strike you when you're doing one, perhaps, but for us to animate, for someone to draw all those teeth on every frame would really be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the happy coincidences of bringing the Hydra to life on the computer is that besides the complexity of 30 heads, we could have the complexity of having 41 teeth on every one of those heads. This is a film where every other character in the movie is drawn by hand mm -hmm. with a pencil. So that means that we have to make the computer character move with the same kind of freedom and flexibility. So on the computer, the skeleton we build is made up of a series of hinges, and then we can literally tweak each one of those to a varying degree so that we can create different shapes and poses and we can get the kind of drag that we're gonna want when that hydra, her mouth wide open, is whipping through the air. We want that whole jaw to be able to swing from left to right. The other thing that we were able to do with the, the computer, though, is achieve a level of dimensional camera work that really is very unusual for a hand-drawn film because moving the camera around dimensionally really loosely is very tough to draw and so we were able to go ahead and do scenes like this where hercules is struggling to stay on pegasus and literally flying in and among these attacking hydras mm -hmm. and we even created this very simple representation of pegasus and hercules that we printed out and gave to the animators so they could use that simply as a perspective guide <laughs> 